Welcome back to Let's Play Crisis 2. I'm Burning Dog Face, and uh, this is going to be a bit unorthodox. We're here for two reasons in this special side video. One of them is that I wanted to address what I'm going to do with the, uh, the rest of the franchise, or at least bring up some questions for you guys, but that can wait. Because uh, another reason we're here is so that I can read a really, really, really long comment. I normally try to avoid that. You know, even some of the ones I've done already in this series in pushing that. But this one is singularly informative, I do have to say. And even though the contrarian in me does kind of bristle at the line, I hope you'll read this, but, uh... The fact of the matter is, this is actually some interesting information, and apparently it's never shared with us in the games themselves. Uh, you know, EA used to have a website with all the lore on it, and they collected it together for the fran Crisis franchise, but that website no longer exists because there hasn't been a new Crisis game since 2013. So what the hell? I might as well give this information to you guys somehow, because again, it is interesting. So shout out to Ragnarok1945. I'll try to keep things short, it'll still be very long anyway, but basically it goes like this. About 65 million years ago, the Ceph came to Earth. However, shortly after their arrival, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs hit the planet. The asteroid's implant knocked the Ceph's main ship offline, sending it crashing down into the Lingshan Islands, or I guess it would become the Lingshan Islands. Uh, without the main ship providing power and energy to the other ships and personnel, all the Ceph on the planet went dormant. In 1896, Jacob Hargreave was born. His strong entrepreneurial spirit allowed him to support his family and ultimately made him one of the richest, most powerful men on the planet. In 1919, he went on a private expedition to investigate the site of the Tunguska event, which took place in June 1908, with Carl Rash and Walter Gould, Nathan Gould's grandfather. Hmm, I didn't know there was a connection there, for example. It was there at Tunguska that Hargreave first discovered the, sec the Ceph's ex existence, sorry. Tripping over my own tongue here. For unknown reasons, something happened at Tunguska that left almost everybody else on the expedition dead. Hargreave carried Rash and Gould across the Siberian wasteland before the three of them were rescued by a British expeditionary force that was operating out of Vladivostok at the time. The expedition gave Hargreave access to Ceph technology, and he understood the, then the threat that the Ceph would pose to humanity someday. And 1919, and he didn't say a word all this time. Man alive. Using the Ceph technology he stole, Hargreave reverse engineered it. After World War II, hey, you know what? Let's go into the, uh, the nanosuit showroom so at least there's a moving visual to stare at. <laughs> Take the time to observe and analyze an area before you make your attack. I've just noticed that the guy in the cell armor is carrying a K volt, which I suppose would be fair if you're going up against other soldiers in nanosuits. Oh uh, yes, using the Ceph technology he stole, Hargreave reverse-engineered it. After World War II, Hargreave established Crynet as a, sub a subsidiary of Hargreave Rash. By the 1970s, Hargreave was forced to put himself into a vegetative state, as he was too old to be mobile anymore. But he continued to devote his life to develop an anti-alien technology by reverse-engineering the Ceph technology he acquired from the Tunguska expedition in 1919. <gasps> Deep breath, yeah. This research ultimately culminated in the Nanosuit 1.0 seen in Crisis 1, which Hargreave considered a prototype. However, it was necessary to test the Nanosuit in combat in order to circumvent the Ceph, which at this point were still dormant. This is why, as Tara said in you know, a previous video, Hargreave had orchestrated the events that happened at Lingshan. The results showed that the Nanosuit was more potent than expected, as it developed a symbiotic bond with its user and could communicate with Ceph nanosystems. This was the reason why, when David Rosenthal and his daughter Helena discovered Ceph fossils, 
The moment Nomad came into contact with them, the Ceph woke back up. If you'll recall back in Crisis 1, and to be fair, I probably don't, after killing General Chan Kyong, Nomad was left trapped in the mine cavern. The only way out was to traverse the alien structure temple, slash temple, which Nomad didn't realize was the Ceph's main ship. Upon traversing through the ship, his nanosuit interacted with the Ceph systems there, bringing the ship back online. With that, all the Ceph across the planet came out of their dormant state. Thus, the Ceph's plan for Earth, something they began 65 million years ago, could now resume. However, uh, according to Hargreave, oh, to Hargreave, the results from the nanosuit testing at Lingshan proved better than he expected. Of course, the nanosuit itself wasn't perfect, so he decided to create a better one. This resulted in the Nanosuit 2.0, the one you're currently wearing, which contained even more advanced technology Hargreave developed, though only a single one was ever made. Hargreave considered the Nanosuit 2.0 its masterpiece, and humanity's best hope against the Ceph. You know what's funny? Because I was thinking that it was an e a literal evolution of the suit Prophet was wearing in the first game, like he'd been symbiotically bonded to it this entire time and it was making itself better. In this regard, uh, Hargreave's desires to get the nanosuit off Alcatraz can be seen as an act of long-term planning, but also egocentrism, because Hargreave wanted to turn himself, his corporation, and the nanosuit project into the post-human savior of humanity. Wow! Oh, the suits are gone. Yeah, that's no good. I'll just pop back in, then. Ha! Huh. Some weapons can hold an extra bullet in the chamber when you reload them with ammo left in the, uh, magazine. <laughs> Where was I? Uh, in the aftermath of Crisis 1, Prophet was outraged that Hargreave used them all as test subjects, as seen in the flashback in a previous video. As a result, he went rogue and stole the Nanosuit 2.0 from Hargreave, becoming a wanted man in the process. Eventually, he learned that the Ceph at Lingshan Island were far from the only Ceph on the planet, and traveled to New York City to warn the people of his findings. But by the time he arrived, the Ceph invasion had already begun, as seen at the beginning of the game. This brings us to Lockhart. In Part 41, you said Lockhart is just jealous because he's supposed to be the big man at Cell, and now there's someone who's better than him because of the nano suit. The truth is slightly more complicated, and has to do with a nanosuit's symbiotic relationship with the wearer. Symbiotic, at least when it comes to alien gizmos, tends to mean that one cannot survive without the other, and such dependence can have negative consequences. Friedrich Nietzsche had once said the following, Beware that when fighting monsters, you yourself do not become a monster. For when you gaze long into the abyss, the Abyss gazes also into you. Basically, that means the more you fight the beast, the more you become the beast. This is a concept frequently used in fictional stories and seen in real life as well. That by the time you've finally killed the monster, you've become so cruel and brutal that you've essentially become the thing you swore to destroy. In this regard, if we're to put a more logical explanation on Lockhart's disgust regarding Hargreaves' quote, bastardized cyborg dream, Lockhart feels that by constantly using Ceph technology against them, you will eventually become just like them. If that's indeed the case, then what would be the point of winning the war against the Ceph? If the more you fight the Ceph, the more you become the Ceph. Wow. Finally, we have to get to the point about Hargreave mentioning the Ceph not liking what they found festering behind the fridge. Remember, the Ceph's plan was supposed to have happened 65 million years ago had their main ship continued to function. By the time it was functioning again due to Nomad's actions in Crisis 1, the Ceph found the whole planet was now infested with parasites, something that wasn't supposed to have happened and was now interfering with their plans for Earth. Basically, look at it this way. Imagine you go to bed one night, and when you wake up in the morning, you find your whole house has been infested with beehives and ant colonies. Would you really just abandon your own home and leave it to them? Or would you try to exterminate them and claim your house back? Oh boy. <sighs> we 
What you're seeing with the Ceph follows the same concept. To them, the human species are ruining their plans for Earth, and they want these parasites to be cleansed. When all is said and done, however, my final judgment for Hargreave still remains that he's to be somewhat sympathized with. Yes, he's the antagonist of the game, but at the end of the day, he did ultimately admit his plan to become the great savior of humanity failed, and gave Alcatraz the final upgrades needed to take on the Ceph. This means Hargreave understood the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, nice Star Trek reference, and humanity's survival is more important than his fame. Which is more than what I can say for real-life politicians nowadays. Wow, ten minutes. So that was very interesting. That does actually fill in a lot of blanks. Almost feels like Hargreaves' backstory would make a pretty good prequel game, huh? <laughs> but the other thing I wanted to address here is, I'm not sure what to do with the rest of the franchise, you guys. Obviously I want to go on to Crisis 3. But one of the only things I know about Crisis 3 is that Michael Psycho Sykes comes back. I saw that in a trailer about four million years ago. Or about ten years ago, now that I think about it. And, uh... Well, I barely remember him, to be perfectly frank. I have trouble remembering any of the really fine details of uh, Crisis 1, even more so than when I was trying to remember uh, Alan Wake 1. So yes, I'm going to be playing Crisis 3 at some point, you best believe that. But, would you guys like to see me go back and play, like, Crisis 1 Remastered just to refresh our memories on what the hell was going on there? They haven't remastered Crisis Warhead, the spin-off starring Psycho, but I do have that game. I bought a physical copy of it four million years ago and then never made a video series out of it. I just kind of forgot after a while, to be perfectly frank, until someone asked about it in this, uh, series. Shout out to Goomba8771 for leaving that comment, by the way. So, uh, yeah, let me know what you want to see there. Do you want to see me go back to Crisis 1 and then do Warhead? Should I just skip Crisis 1 and go to Warhead? See, I wasn't sure about that one. Because, of course, the plot of Warhead is directly and intrinsically tied to the plot of One, and if I can't remember that, well... <laughs> I don't know. I'm really tempted by the idea, I've gotta say. Put Crisis 1 Remastered on my uh, Steam wishlist and everything. <laughs> but uh, if you guys don't want to see it, you know, I, I totally understand that. It's just very strange to think that I've only done one game twice, and now I'm thinking about doing it for another game that did not move me the way Alan Wake did, except it's still a really rad shooter, so I don't even know. So yeah, let me, let me know what you guys would prefer. Should I just say screw the past and move on to Crisis 3 next? It wouldn't be right after this series, of course, but you know. Should I go after Crisis 1 and then do Warhead before rounding on 3? Or should I just focus on 3 and then move forward into the future when 4 comes out, huh? Let me know what you guys would prefer. And in the meantime, I'm going to call this supplemental episode here. Go get recording something else so that I can get back into fighting the Ceph. <laughs> Once again, thanks for the information, Ragnarok1945. Hope that filled in some blanks for everybody. So yes, I'm Burning Dogface, and I will see you on the next real episode of Let's Play Crisis 2, when the battle continues, and hopefully I don't die as many times as that last somewhat embarrassing video. <laughs> Later!